Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here. I was at the dinner last year when the RSRT UK was a twinkle in the eye of Rachel and her colleagues. And it's amazing how it's come on in one year, um, being recognized as a, as a major newcomer on the charitable scene. But of course that means absolutely nothing uh, compared to what its goals are, which is trying to alleviate the, the issues that arise from this devastating disorder. I um, have been involved in related research, as, uh, as Christopher said, for, for a very long time. We, I, used to be, I used to revel in being a basic scientist. Blue skies, curiosity, increasing human knowledge, and of no conceivable use to anybody. Um, and uh, that's the way I really liked it. Uh, but then, uh, and in fact, we discovered the... Um, MECP2 protein, I apologize for this cumbersome name which I'm responsible for, um, in Vienna at a time when Andreas Rett, the discoverer of Rett syndrome, was working in Vienna. I never knew Andreas Rett and he unfortunately died before the realization that uh, the, the protein we had found and the gene it in, uh, that it encodes it are the cause of Rett syndrome. That discovery was made by Huda Zogby's lab in, in the United States, and uh, my, almost my first realization of this was when I got a call from Monica Kunrads, who founded uh, Rett Syndrome Rett's Research Trust in the US. And from then on, I have to say, the idea that what one was doing was actually useful and might even make a difference of a profound kind was extremely seductive, and our research now most of it is devoted towards trying to realize that kind of dream um, because uh, I, it seems that such an unbelievably um, worthwhile cause. So um, what I was going to say tonight was just that I believe RSRT deserves support because it's doing it the right way. Uh, and the first... Um, thing that it's doing the right way is, is to treat science as global. There are plenty of charities for all sorts of disorders, not just uh, Rett syndrome, where money is raised locally and then it is also spent locally uh, and the, um, relationships are built up with local scientists, but that's not the way to do science. There's, there's, there's really no such thing as local science. There's no such thing as national science. There is only global science. and. Uh, some, what one wants to do is find the best scientists in the world who can possibly contribute to solving this uh, problem and fund them. And that is RSRT's approach. It requires uh, an effort because you can't simply uh, dispense the money without, uh, in, without due diligence. And setting that up is actually quite tricky. You, you need a network of people uh, who are experts in the area and who can give dispassionate, uh, not in any way self-interested advice about which the best research is. And uh, RSRT has that. It has um, the goodwill and the support of many scientists. And that's what allows them to um, uh, spend their money uh, wisely and uh, across the world. I mean, if the best research on Rett syndrome was in Bhutan, that's where it would be supported. Uh, as it happens, the best research isn't in Bhutan, but uh, wherever one goes, wherever the good research is, that's where you want to, f you, you want to find it and, and fund it. So why, why is uh, Rett syndrome uh, attracting scientists? Well, it has, it has a number of uh, ingredients, some of which you may have heard of and some of which you may not have heard of. First, First thing is it's for scientists uh, to get interested in things. Scientists, like everybody else, are, are quite self-interested in a way. They have their own career structure, their own way of progressing within it, and one has to seduce them with um, uh, you know, uh, advantages that they recognize in addition to the worthiness of the cause, which, which Rett syndrome obviously is. So one of the things to do with Rett syndrome is, is that it involves epigenetics, so I'm using that. It's, it's not another type of pasta. It's a, it's a, um, 
it's uh, basically marks added onto your DNA that, that decide how it will be used. And uh, these are stable, and they change the way your genome will work. It's a very, uh, I don't, I'm not going to bore you with why, but it's a, a very uh, interesting area. It's a very new and exciting area, and there's a huge amount of interest in it among scientists. And MECP2, MECP2, is a protein that reads those messages on the DNA. That's what it appears uh, to do. So there you have the epigenetics ingredient that makes for interesting science. Then you have the brain, the last forefront of uh, biology in terms of completely unknown areas. And the brain, it's, it's yielding, but it's yielding slowly to research. Then it's the fact that this is, uh, well, it has anyway been classified as an autism spectrum disorder. I'm not sure it still is. Br autism is so broad anyway, it doesn't really, really matter. But we know precisely what the cause is. In, virtual, in, in the vast majority of cases, we know that this one gene, the MECP2 gene, is responsible. In the case of autism, which is far more common, genetically it's incredibly complicated. There are multiple genes involved, and that means attacking it and deciding how to be able to go about treating it is much more difficult. Rett syndrome, we know the cause, albeit there are lots of things we don't know about how it works. And then there's an animal model. In many cases, you obviously can't uh, do uh, probing experiments with anything but an animal model, but you worry always that the animal might not be like the human. In the case of Rett syndrome, the animal model, the mouse model, is remarkably like the human situation in such a way that one can convince anybody that what you see in the mouse when it doesn't have MECP2, MECP2, is close to what you see in humans that don't have MECP2. And this is a huge advantage. It means one can study the mouse uh, and, and learn profound things about the way this system works. And finally, as Christopher alluded to, came the totally unexpected result that you can take an animal that is terminally ill, a male, uh, and uh, is exhibiting extreme symptoms. You simply put back the protein, put back the missing bit of the machine, if you like, and it, it, it remarkably uh, reversed. And, and suddenly, from, from being a, a, a disorder that one had to imagine, uh, unless you could catch it before it started, you wouldn't have any hope, it became a disorder where it was uh, reasonable to start searching seriously for therapies. And that's really what's happening now. There are a lot of laboratories, and there are excellent laboratories spending um, considerable amounts of time um, because of all the exciting features of Rett syndrome, but also because it looks like it might be tractable. And um, one can't predict the future. One can't say, you know, in two years or five years or, t or even ten years that there will be something uh, that would be therapeutically uh, useful. But there are some signs from some directions that uh, it's going to be more tractable, not least the reversibility, but also other aspects of work that suggest that this is a, a door that if one pushes hard enough at, uh, may uh, swing open. So um, there is a lot going on in the world now uh, in, in, in research, and actually a lot of the best of it is supported by RSRT. So what I'd um, like to... Uh, assure you is that in, in my opinion anyway, um, and, and you have to, I, I, my lab actually gets some funding, so I should declare that as my conflict, but I'm also aware that a of a lot of the research that goes on which, which I'm not involved. The research is exciting. It's not pot boiling, let's do the obvious thing and see what happens. There is some really creative science going on. Some of it was alluded to in the projects that Rachel men mentioned are being funded. RSRT really is pushing the envelope, it's bringing in the best scientists, it's interesting them in Rett syndrome, and then it is uh, provoking them to get their best ideas and try and uh, make them work towards getting this, this uh, distressing condition into a state where, getting the research into a state where it can suggest therapies. So um, I think you should feel confident that the money you earn the hard way through wonderful events like this is being handed out on a meritocratic basis and being withdrawn where that, that merit is no longer present 
in a present in a, in a ruthless way that makes sure it is spent in the best possible manner. And so um, I am incredibly impressed by RSIT, and I'm not the only person. I know a lot of people who feel that it is a paradigm for the way in which this kind of charity should, should work. So um, I hope that you will continue to support it, and I would love to be able to come back one day, either me or whoever you decide to fund instead of me once I've blown my uh, top, um, is, would come back and tell you that it was, uh, had given rise to a, a therapy that really makes a difference. Thank you very much.